Jesus, thank you for everything you're doing in the earth today. Thank you, Lord God, for the amazing strategies of global redemption that you are unfolding right now, the posturing you're doing with people and nations, the preparation you're doing for the next move of your strategy. We just look up and celebrate everything that we see, everything that we're, you're doing, Lord. We just bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Um, what a lovely morning it's been. And, uh, and what mornings like this really tend to be all about are our aligning ourselves with the heart of God, coming into alignment with Jesus. And he's very patient to do that, and very often he will go to great pains <laughs> to accomplish that. Certainly that's what he did on the cross. He went to great pains in order to align humanity with the possibility of freedom in the Father's embrace. And from that day until today, his mercies are new every morning, and he, can, he comes again and again and again and whispers course correction and grace power and possibility to change the direction we're going and to move in alignment with him, to get in step with him. The last couple Sundays um, really have been permeated, in a sense, with the, with the spice, if you will, of repentance. And we are in, as I mentioned last week, we're in what in, in the Hebrew calendar is called the three weeks that historically uh, remember the, the time between, in the Hebrew calendar, the 17th of Tammuz to the 9th of Av. Those are, those are dates in the Hebrew calendar that encompass a three-week period from when the, bre the walls of Jerusalem were first breached by the Romans and finally the temple was destroyed back in 70 AD. And so it has come down in Jewish tradition to be a, a period of mourning. Um, and not just mourning, but as I mentioned last week, a period of possibility because it resets your life. You pause, you stop, you think, you repent, you align, and then you see possibility opening up in front of you. Why? Because you're no longer running pell-mell in your own direction, after your own choices, after your own flesh, or your own best intentions. You've paused, you've adjusted course, you've allowed the Lord to fine-tune your direction, and now you find yourself moving in greater freedom, with greater hope, greater possibility, greater life, greater light, more joy, because that's what repentance does. That's exactly what it does. And I remember one of the first uh, conferences I ever spoke at was a, was a conference that uh, we held at our church when we lived in South Africa. And uh, as pastors, we divvied up the conversation. And so it came to me to speak about repentance. And I thought, darn it. Repentance, you know, at the, it was, you know, 30 years ago or something like that. I thought, Repent, that's, that's, nobody wants to talk about repentance. You know, that's just a, you know, chest beating, you know, mea culpa, head bowed, tears flowing kind of, okay, something you got to do to get where you need to go. But nobody wants to talk about repentance. And, and as I prepared for that, for that conversation on that occasion so long ago, I actually discovered some beautiful truths about repentance that are not news to any of us here. But I remember on that occasion um, teaching that repentance puts us in a better position than Adam and Eve. It occurred to me how better off are we as a people than Adam and Eve who really had a perfect environment, therefore choices very limited, but we uh, marinating in constant choices and challenges and strategies put forth by the world and the enemy are on a daily basis choosing Jesus. And that strengthens our character. And it strengthens our relationship with him in a way that Adam and Eve didn't have the option for. You understand what I'm saying? And so at the end of the day, God will have a bride who is, who is superior to Adam and Eve's condition simply by virtue of the fact that the bride made a choice on a regular basis. And God's confident, confidence in the love of the bride for his son will be unwavering simply because over the millennia, he's watched in again and again and again, his bride choose him through the good gift of repentance. 
And I remember I've taught several times on repentance over the years, even here at Flame Tree. And I remember I was looking over at some of the old titles I, 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 I uh, spoke under. One was repent to joy. Another was repent to goodness. And the whole, the whole tenor of those teachings for me was the idea, the repentance is far from being the thing we have to do to get God's favor. That somehow God looks at us sideways until he sees tears streaming down our face and our knees red at raw from, from, from being, you know, a, in abject terror before him in our, in our deep, heartfelt religious repentance. Far from that, repentance is a gift that God has given us that sets us apart from everything in creation. It is a good gift whereby it is one of the most precious things that the Father has given his bride to manage our walk with him. It's something we can tap into every day, and especially when we begin to understand it is a course adjustment, not an acknowledgement of gross error. It is simply an acknowledgement that, hey, Jesus is perfect. I am not. One day I will be like him. Until that day, God, continue to move me in the direction of your son. Let me walk in that direction correct direction. Remember I was talking about Nahum and Zechariah about, you know, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and the, the idea came of, of uh, I think it was even last week, I spoke about the fact that repentance and forgiveness are, are twins in the same way that truth and mercy are twins. Yeah? And that forgiveness, if, if a straight line, if the course of our life is set by two points, two points define a line in geography or in geometry, if, if, if those two points are, number one, in the past, forgiveness, forgiving those things that have gone before, that have been accomplished, that have been done to us, that speaks of our past, letting go of that. That's that, that point that speaks of the past. And repentance actually speaks of our direction. It speaks of our trajectory. It speaks of our, of our future. Because it's not so much in the moment beating our chest over, over failure that we perceive, but it's rather simply acknowledging, you know what, once again, Lord, I, reckon, I recognize I'm slightly off course or I'm grossly off course. Either way, all it requires is repentance. It's a course Adjustment, Lord God, forgive me for missing the mark, for defecting from the character of Jesus, and correct my course. Let me come back. And he, he welcomes with open arms. There is no shame in repentance. Absolutely none at all. I remember years ago reading, and I've shared this with you in times past before too, but I, I actually read Robinson Crusoe. And I don't, I don't know many people. How many people have read Robinson Crusoe? There's a smattering of hands all about my age. Yes. <laughs> and bless you all. What a classic book. But you got to wade through it. But in that, Crusoe on the island is commiserating with himself because there's no one else to talk to. And he writes, I have often observed how incongruous and irrational the common temper of mankind is, especially of youth. To that reason, that good thought, which ought to guide them in such cases, namely, that they are not ashamed to sin and yet are ashamed to repent, not ashamed for the action for which they ought justly be esteemed fools, but are ashamed of the returning, which can only make them be esteemed wise men. And that is an eternal truth. The enemy has contrived to take this good gift of heaven and, and turn it and make it dark, and, uh, you know, uh, laced with shame and something we, we, we would rather not uh, engage in. And it's gotten a bad rap over the centuries, too. Uh, the traditional church for centuries has religified, uh, uh, you know, repentance to the point that we beat our chest and we get on our knees and we accomplish an outward sign of repentance, but there's no inward transformation. And at times with revival, the Lord has breathed new life on it again, and then we take it too far the other way to the point where now in some charismatic circles, they would actually teach you have need of repentance only once in your life. When you're born again, after that, no repentance is necessary. And you might have heard that sort of foolishness as well. And obviously, God has patience with both extremes. He is, he is 
he is maneuvering his bride to that perfect place where she will stand without <coughs> spot or wrinkle. In the meantime, you know, these extreme positions are the tendency of mankind and what we not want in wisdom, in reason, to use the word that Crusoe used in his book, right? To be reasonable and reckon, wait a second, it's neither, it's neither this nor that, but <coughs> repentance is a gift that we have received from heaven whereby we can move back into the goodness of God, move back into the joy of God. It's something we can do every day and with something we ought to, with wisdom, run to do every day because God has offered it to us and it's such, such a blessing. Yeah. And um, simply put, to live for the Lord, you have to put aside the things that lead you away from him. Amen? That's what repentance accomplishes for us. Colossians 3, 5. Therefore, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lusts, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. If you allow sin and bad habits to live, they will destroy your spirit, your joy, and your walk with God. Okay, that's just facts. That's not a lash. That's not a prod. That's not a shame on you. That's not a, a whack from the schoolmaster. That's simply truth. And God in his passion for his bride invites us to come and adjust our course so that we can be free of the things that would rob us of life and joy and an experience of his goodness. And so repentance really is to come back to the joy and life of God, come back to the goodness of of God. It's either kill or be killed. And so at first, with repentance, we determine to put to death the things of the flesh, the things that are misaligned with Jesus, that do not equate his personality, his character, that somehow we know in our spirits offend him. So we say, no, in Jesus' name, I'm done. I'm done with that. Yeah. But having understood that, it deals with the, the deadly things in our lives, but it also sets our course. And it's something beautiful that sets us on the way that will lead us to the image of Christ in our lives. And that's what our passion is. That's what we are for. Jesus said in Matthew 16, take up your cross daily. Right? And what? Follow me. It's the same two ideas once again. If not, take up your cross, at least in part, speaks of the challenge to forgiveness. Because that is something we have to bear. Sometimes it feels wholly unfair to release others in forgiveness, but we take up our cross because Jesus from that very cross said, Father, forgive them. So too, in imitation of him, we release, we forgive, we take up our cross daily. Yeah. And then we follow him. That is repentance. Because to follow him means to observe him. And there, whenever he turns or moves this way or that, we adjust course so that we can follow him. That's repentance. That's all it is. Staying on course with him. In the, in the pre-service prayer, too, Ginny had this picture of getting in the slipstream of God in our lives. And it occurred to me, and again, I don't know if, this, if you'll be able to relate to this, those of you that don't wa watch Formula One racing, but... Um, you know, or any kind of auto racing, right? Everybody knows about the slipstream. You've got the car that's fastest that inevitably is leading the pack, but a slower car has the possibility of coming in behind that car into the slipstream, using less horsepower to maintain the same speed, and at the opportune moment, will will slip out and be flung out, catapulted out from behind that car by the slipstream and shoot ahead with the opportunity to do greater things. And it, speak, it spoke to me this morning as we were praying about what Jesus does. He's, he's the fastest. He's the best. He's perfection. But his grace allows us to move into his slipstream. And on occasion, he will signal us to, to be catapulted out from behind him to do greater things than he did to be as assigned to issues in the world that he has not yet touched and in his name to do what he would do if he were there. And so we, he, we were flung out from behind him. And he celebrates and laughs as we, as we flash by to, in obedience, do what he requires us to do. And repentance is the thing that gets us into the slipstream of Jesus. It's adjusting our course, not, not 
making our own way, not pushing the air in front of us by ourselves and our own strength, that religious foolishness that, you know, the, the more we sweat, the tired, more tired we get, the, the more worn out we are, speaks to how spiritual we are. Right? How, how many conversations have you had like that in, 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 in history, in time? How are you doing? Oh, it's hard, brother. Oh, if only you knew what I had, you know, and, and you know, and the idea is that we back there going, wow, so spiritual. Wow, I had no idea. My goodness, you're really fighting the fight. That's the, now sometimes that's legitimate because sometimes it is hard. And sometimes there is an honest response to say, I'm worn out. And that's when you need someone to come by and lift up your hands and show you a stone to take rest on while the battle continues. But other times it's just plain religion. It's just plain foolishness. It's just plain flesh. Yeah. I'm worn out. Yeah. Where the heck was I going with that? I have no <laughs> idea. I'm just following some breadcrumbs this morning. Seriously, I, you know, there, there's so much good here. Um, Come on. Come on, Steve. Yeah, I hear you. Did you share a dream that I had this morning? Of course you did. <laughs> um, it's, all, it's all on what Joel's talking about here. So, um, I had a short dream this morning, uh, just before waking up. And um, in the dream, I had the question, are you toxic? I put my hand up. <laughs> and then the scene goes to a, um Eskimo sort of um, house hut thing. And two guys walked out of this uh, home of an Esco Eskimo people. And they were walking in the snow. And the snow is soft, you know, so their feet are going down in the snow. And, they, and, and, and there were a couple of bulls on the side and uh, they saw these guys and then the guys saw the balls and the guys are running for as fast as they could go in the snow. Uh, but the bulls had the advantage over them and they caught up with them and um, you know what the enemy's like, he will destroy. Those poor guys didn't survive. Okay, and it all comes around, are you toxic? And our relationships and in our... Um, whatever it might be, our heart with the Lord. You know, God is after our hearts. So oftentimes we think we're forgiven and, uh, you know, we're deceiving ourselves or, you know, the heart is very deceptive. That's a scripture. And, uh, you know, we need to be continually seeking the Lord and his heart because he loves us. And if there's something there, help, ask him his help to get you past it. Amen? That helps. That helps. That's good. That's true. That's true. And that's what this whole morning has been about. The whole worship has been drawing us in to stand before him, to, to, to come close enough to him so that his, his presence transforms us. Yeah. We are in him. He is in us. That transformation continues. Uh, look, time is, is running here. Let me just share a few illustrations of what I'm talking about. You know, in Luke 15... There are three parables that Jesus brings. Um, one is about the, the lost sheep out of a hundred. Then following immediately upon that is the one coin out of ten. Then following immediately upon that is the, par prod prodigals, the parable of the prodigal son, one son out of two. So one out of a hundred, one out of ten, and one out of two. And if you read those parables in, the, in this context of, of repentance, you see something quite beautiful. Because they, all of them virtually begin and end with celebration. Yeah? The one sheep is lost and it's found. The one coin is lost and it is found. The one son was lost and it is found. But in these parables, we never get the sense that God ever beat the lost sheep or became embittered over the lost coin or was angry over the lost son. That is religion. And that is what the church, unfortunately, has demonstrated, if not taught, 
over the generations. That to be that lost sheep is to be berated and beaten until we learn discipline. To be the lost coin is to, is to cause bitterness in the heart of God. God can't love me for all the things I've done. Yeah? And to be that lost son, how can I possibly return because I've squandered everything Jesus did for me? There's no way home. That is what religion has taught. The only way home being to climb these steps on my knees until they bleed or to whip myself bloody on the back or to do things that will impress the God who flung the stars into space, which is a virtual impossibility. And that is the, the burden, the insidious nature of the religious spirit that we want to break today in Jesus name wherever it needs breaking wherever it needs breaking I know we've walked in freedom for a long time by the grace of God because he's been teaching and leading us for several generations now from revival to revival and we're finding ourselves in a precious mix of the presence of God it's a it's a wonderful octane that's the word just dropped into my spirit yeah, when you pull up to the petrol station, you, you'd love to afford, you know, the 98 octane. But most of us don't bother to put that in because, well, our cars aren't worth it. But if we were driving a Ferrari, boom, you want, the, you know, you want the, the stuff that burns hottest. We want the stuff that gets the best mileage, that burns most cleanly, that is the most efficient. And so this is w the environment that God has brought us into, but it does not preclude the discipline daily of adjusting our course. Course. We can be going on all 12 cylinders on 98 octane, but, but if we're two degrees off at the end of the day, we are way off the mark. We have to continually be adjusting course, and that is repentance. That's what repentance is. And so the sheep, the coin, the son, each come back not to berating or to discipline, but to joy, to celebration. And this is what God is saying. Come, come to me. Adjust your course once again. Run towards me. See my face is smiling. It's not stern and sear and separate from you and, 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 and holding the promise of, 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 of hard discipline. It's rather open son, daughter, brother, sister. Run to me, he says. Run to me. Come, come. Come on, I want to teach you my ways. And it's not hard if you stay close to me. You'll be doing things that you never thought possible if you stay in my slipstream. And then, at my signal, get, allow me to catapult you into an assignment. You'll find yourself operating in an anointing you never thought you had that you don't in the natural have power for. You will find yourself flying into the purposes of God and accomplishing great things in the name of Jesus simply because you were where you you belonged through the good gift of repentance on a regular basis. Do not waste a moment. Don't waste a day. Do not waste a week or a month. Don't wait for the, the move of God, you know, somehow falling foul of the whispers of the Spirit that still speak to you and say that you are not worthy that you are not up to the task that some, or that you are too old or you are too young or you are too inexperienced or untried or uneducated. None of those things are true. None of them are true. Let those lies be broken off again today in Jesus' name. And let, let the truth of the, the salvation that we've received, this great, great, great salvation, flood your life, mind, body, soul, and spirit again with hope, with hope. Because of all that Jesus has already done for you. There were three. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end because we've got a, a few announcements we have to get to. But there were, there were three women that, as I was thinking about repentance again, I wanted to share, uh, uh, bring your, your minds to these women again with whom you are quite familiar. The first is in, uh, in uh, where is it? <clears throat> Luke 7. Yeah. You remember the sinful woman, as the Bible puts it? We don't know what her sin was, but let's just say she was just like us. Okay? She wasn't perfect, so she was a sinner. All right? Without yet an encounter with Jesus. Do you remember? We've taught you this before. Before Jesus, we were sinners. We are no longer sinners. We are saints who occasionally sin. And for that occasional moment, we need repentance. And that's pretty much every day. 
every single day, right? So this woman before her encounter with Jesus is described as a sinner, and she comes to Jesus while he's reclining at the house of the Pharisee. You remember the story? And she begins weeping over her awareness of her own condition, wiping her his feet with her tears and drying them with her hair and anointing those same feet with perfume. It was an extravagant display of of awareness, and she is berated for that by the Pharisee vicariously through his conversation with Jesus, and Jesus just celebrates her. He said, you didn't do any of these things when I came into your house, but she hasn't stopped. Therefore, her sins are forgiven, which is only the right response of genuine repentance. So what we have here is a picture of a woman who is courageous enough and daring enough to believe in the goodness of God. She exposes herself absolutely to inevitable ridicule, but none of that compares. She's drawn by the goodness of God into repentance. She dares to believe that God is good. And so she performs this ex extravagant worship and repentance and is rewarded for it. Another is in Mark 7. And in Mark, you have the story of... Uh, um, the Syrophoenician woman, you remember? The, the Lebanese woman, if you will. She's not Jewish. Jesus finds himself moving through this, the area of modern-day Lebanon, and this woman comes desperate. Why? Because her daughter is demon-possessed, and she says, Lord, Lord, heal my daughter. And he says, I'm come for the, for the house of Israel. I can't, I can't, it's not fair to give you the bread that is for the Jewish. You know, and, and this is such a mysterious encounter because Jesus seems to snub her in a very un-Jesus-like way. And I'm still, I still chew on this one now and again and go, God, well, there's, I'm missing something here. Yeah. But then she persists, remember, she says, but, it's, but even the dogs can have the crumbs off the children's table. And Jesus says, because of that answer, your daughter is healed. Go away with blessing. And I reckon sometimes, guys, this is an example of God's, uh, per, uh, you know, uh, periodically he will, he will offend our brain to test our heart. He will. And isn't COVID one of those times? Isn't he just rattling our brains? All of us are running around like headless chickens trying to get a handle on this thing and trying to come up with a, with, a, with a unified theory about COVID and who's responsible and what's it mean and theologically and politically and, and globally. And, blah, blah, blah. and we're all going nuts. Our brains, I can see smoke coming out of some people's ears because the, you're overheating on this stuff. And there's a lot, there's truth in there and there's rubbish and there's strategies and there's deception and there's all sorts of stuff. So get your eyes on Jesus. Because sometimes he will just offend your brain and see, just to test your heart. Where are you at? Are you going to remember with all of, okay, apply your brain power, but occasionally repent. Lord, I'm sorry. I've just been preoccupied. Yeah, repent. He's looking at your heart, just like this woman. Yeah, offended her brain. What? To test her heart till she received what she was pursuing. There's another one at, in, in, in Matthew 9. These, and interestingly, all these examples are women who had the courage to believe in the goodness of God and to go after it. Yeah? And of course, um, one of the words this morning somebody mentioned referred to the woman with the hemorrhage again. I can't remember who did. Wendy? You, me you mentioned it also, Wendy? And so here also is a woman who so dares to believe in the goodness of God that she fights through all resistance and lays hold of him, trusting in his goodness. Guys, that's repentance. That's exactly what repentance is. Trusting in the goodness of God and going after it regardless of the cost. Yeah? All right. Look, I, um, I love repentance. And anticipating this morning, um, I have a lot to say about repentance. <laughs> because the book is so full of beautiful examples. And it's just glorious, color-strewn landscapes of the beauty and joy and goodness and delight and reward of repentance. And seeing as we are in the season, if you will, uh, prophetically of repentance leading to ultimately what would be the destruction of the temple and the launching, if you will, of the gospel into the world. 
um, breaking the egg, if you will, and, and giving the goodness out to the kingdom. You know, it, it behooves us to make certain that we take advantage of this season, that we pause, realign your hearts with him, uh, trust him again, okay? Put down all of the burning questions. Pick up the ones he hands to you. Ask God for wisdom and insight and understanding. Yes, amen. Let's not be, you know, foolish. But at the same time, allow him to do the heavy lifting. Allow him to, to cut the wave, to push the air, get in the slipstream. Come under the shadow of his wing. Run into his name. <sighs> yeah. Amen. All right. Just pause for a second. Just, just get quiet where you are right now. And uh, ask the Holy Spirit if there's an issue that needs repenting of in your life, whether it be major or minor, historic or current. What is the Holy Spirit breathing on this morning? Just let it rise to the surface and then simply give it up to him. Just declare your determination. Lord, I want to align my life with you in this area. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for taking that out of my view, out of my way, and replacing it with a clear view of the horizon, the direction, with joy, with a sense of your kindness and goodness. Get the clutter out of my life, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We repent in your name to be more like you. Amen. Amen.